Good afternoon and thank you for coming. And I can say that we are happy to be here, um, although the subject is more or less very sad. But um, we wish to talk about Yemen also from different perspectives, so um, we don't want to only to talk about war. Um, and first, uh, I wish to say that I'm very sorry because Abdurrahman Hussein is not with us and because he's still waiting in Turkey the visa to come to Europe. And that's what happened to Yemenis. It's just an example. So, uh, as you know, we are talking about, we are going to talk about Yemen and um, why we choose this. Uh, we named this panel Yemen the Silent War. Uh, it's more or less obvious because Yemen is presented by Western media as the high house of Al Qaeda or the kingdom of child brides. We can say it's not true, I mean, but Yemen is not only this. Uh, it's a nation, well, right now I, I read some doubts about it, but anyway, it's a country with a millenary culture and youthful creativity. And it was very clear, especially after the uprisings of 2011, and when we will show you uh, what the Yemeni filmmakers, they are able to do in Yemen, uh, you will find out that there are a lot of hopes there and young people that they need to have voice. So let me introduce you uh, to you our speakers, this panel, and, and I'm really very happy because I, I think I really I have here, and I'm very sorry again to don't have Abdul Rahman saying, people that for real they, they did are still doing a great job about this country, about Yemen. So, um, Yona Craig, Yona Craig is, I can say that she's the colleague who really covers Yemen more than every, everyone else, and um, um, she's just back from, from Yemen, and she traveled a lot and for a long time in the country, so uh, she for real knows what, what is going on on the ground, or she's trying to understand <laughs> because uh, it's a complex situation. Um, Malachi Brown, uh, he's editor of Reportedly, but we can say that. Uh, in a few weeks you will go to New York Times, right? Yes. Okay, so, and Malachi, he never been to, um, to Yemen, but he did a very, very important deep investigation about how uh, European countries are involved in this conflict, and especially Italy and uh, tracking the, um, um, the bombs sold by uh, an Italian-German company to Saudis. And then those bombs, they go from, from Sardinia and to Jeddah, and then there they, they will be dropped on Yemenis. And, and last but not least, I can say Sarah Ishak, and Sarah, she's, um, she's half Yemeni and half um, uh, British, right? And, um, and uh, what is really important to say about Sarah is that maybe you know, and she ran for, um, for the Oscars in 2014 with Karamas on the Walls, which is a very great documentary about uh, what happened during the uprising in, in Yemen. The only situation we can say that was violent a little bit, but uh, the uprising in Yemen was for real the, the most peaceful one. And, uh, and Sarah is training uh, some young uh, filmmakers and in Yemen, and um, which is something really important because um, she established in Sana an association, a group of people that they are working hard to show another phase of the country. So, um, uh, first of all, I wish to give the floor to Iona. 
and because we, we wish to understand the context. And you just come back from, from Yemen, so <laughs> uh, maybe you can tell us what's going on there. Um, well, I'll try, but I think, um, thank, firstly, thank you very much to the International Journalism Festival for having us here. It's been extremely generous of them uh, this week, looking after us all so well, and also to Laura, actually, for getting kind of Yemen onto the agenda over these few days. Um, it's hard to get Yemen on the, anybody's agenda um, at the best of times and at the worst of times. Uh, I've been covering Yemen. I was living in Yemen from 2010 to the end of 2014. Uh, when the conflict or the civil war, as we now know it, started by everybody's sort of estimation on March 26th last year, I spent about six months in country um, in the first year of the war and traveled over 2,000 miles around the country um, in that time. So I've been very fortunate to be able to not just get the perspective from Sana'a, which is the capital, but also travel north up towards the Saudi border, um, into the south, into Taiz, into Aden, to the east, to Mukalla, to northern Hadramount, and uh, I've also had the unfortunate pleasure of having to do the crossing by boat three times between Djibouti uh, and the southern coast in order to get in and out of the country. Um, but when we talk about the silent war in Yemen, the coverage of Yemen has, has for a long time, or always, um, been moderate compared to the rest of the region. And really, uh, as the media in general, we are guilty of following a similar narrative to Western governments on Yemen. And that has always been about seeing Yemen through the prism of Al-Qaeda. And that's really gone probably back to the USS Cole um, when it was attacked in Aden. And ever since then, really, uh, the Western media and Western governments, the real focus and interest in Yemen has only been about counterterrorism, And that's always been sort of the disappointing factor, I think I realized after spending a pretty very short time in Yemen, was the fact that um, as, as journalists and as media in general, we were perpetuating that by only ever really writing about Yemen when it was about Al Qaeda. Uh, I arrived in Yemen two weeks before the parcel bombs plot, as it became known as. Um, and of course, the first piece I ever wrote for a national newspaper uh, was the front page of the Times, and it was about the plot that was then traced back to Anwar Awlaki um, of cargo bombs that were, were, that were found on two planes bound for America. The only exception then came, and it was a huge relief, was in 2011 during the revolution. Uh, that was the first time that we as journalists and freelancers on the ground got to talk about the politics of Yemen and also the issues being faced by Yemenis on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, it was a rare opportunity. We were able to do that probably for a few months until uh, Al-Qaeda took control of a few towns in the south and then suddenly the narrative switched. Um, and that event happened conveniently on the same day that government troops swept into tires um, and torched a whole protest camp but that barely got a mention into the international media, and instead everybody focused on Al-Qaeda, who was basically handed control um, of a city in southern Yemen. Well, it wasn't a city, it's a town, a very small town. I've been there several times, but the media likes to call it a city. Even the BBC, when they looked back and did their own internal review of, of the Arab Spring, as it became known, said that, yes, they not covered Yemen enough. And it used to become a joke a little bit from us stringers on the ground in Yemen that when the BBC turned up, um, by the way, they're not the only ones guilty of this, but because they did their own internal review at least, um, when they turned up, which was normally about once a year, that we knew exactly what three stories they would cover. That would be Al-Qaeda, GAT, which is the local leaf that Yemenis chew, um, and water. Uh, don't get me wrong, the water issue is important, but there was no nuance into the politics of what was going on in the country there was very little about uh, the daily issues that Yemenis faced, never mind the real reasons behind why people even were protesting in 2011, which was without a shadow of a doubt the largest sit-in um, across the region at that time was in Sana'a. That was a protest camp that stretched for well over a, a mile, mile and a half at one stage through the middle of the city, and that was a permanent sit-in. But very rarely would have you seen that on your TVs at home. 
Um, so I think there's always been a real lack of awareness of the politics in Yemen. And that means that then leading up to this conflict, there was always going to be a war in Yemen. I think you could have said that even before 2011. It was a question of when, not if, because of the politics on the ground. Um, so when it actually happened, and as that build-up happened in 2014, everybody knew it was coming. Everybody on the ground in Yemen knew it was coming. Uh, but even then, when I, was in, when I was in Sana'a and I was filing then as the Times correspondent, 50% of my copy was getting spiked. It was being commissioned, and it was, you get a spike rate. Spike means they don't actually print it, they don't run your story. Um, you get a reduced rate, and it also means you can't sell the story to anybody else without permission. So even when the Houthis came eventually to the edges of Sana'a before they actually came into the city, it was, there was a sense of inevit inevitability about what was going to happen. Um, and even then, when you're jumping up and down at editors saying, look here, there's a, there's a war going to start, and it's, and it's coming. Nobody cared. Everybody was obviously already focused on, on what was going on in Syria. And even when the Houthis stormed into Sana'a and took control of the city in September 2014, by my recollection, I think it made about 300 words in, in the Times, uh, tops probably. Uh, and that was after four days of fighting on the outskirts of the city. Uh, and I felt pretty jaded, I have to say, by that stage. Um, and it got to the point of, you know, what am I doing here? Is there any point in even being here? Um, in the sense that a lot of the stuff was being run as maybe 30, 40 words, wire copy, um, in the national newspapers back in the UK, and trying to get people interested into what was happening in Yemen, what was going to happen as well, um, was really, really hard. So when the war did, did kick off in Yemen, and let me tell you, it kicked off before the Saudis started bombing. That just added another in very complex situation and much more violent conflict it meant. Um, it was really little surprise um, that there was so little coverage uh, of what was happening, and there has continued to be so. It's, it's a continuation of, what, of what's been happening um, with the coverage of Yemen over many years. Uh, and now, of course, many people, as we know, are suffering inside Yemen. And it's become even more difficult to cover than it was before. Um, because of the security situation, because of stages of getting in and out of the country, it's actually quite easy to get into Sana'a right now. But there have been stages where it's been incredibly difficult. Um, now there is, though, some more genuine excuses why it's more difficult for the media to get in there. But internationally, there's very little background knowledge into what on earth is going on with the politics in Yemen, because nobody's paid attention for the last decade, really. On that cheery note, I will we'll come around again, but I will, I will pass it on to... <laughs> Over to you, Malaki. Uh, what about uh, European interests in, in Yemen? What did you discover with your investigation? Which is a really very important investigation. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll get to the investigation um, uh, shortly, Laura, but I wanted to start by showing that um, even if mainstream media don't have correspondents on the ground, like Iona or Adam Barron or Tom Finn or others who were there previously, there are people there in um, Yemen who are engaging in acts of journalism every day in documenting what's going on there, eyewitnesses, um, people providing opinion on it. I'll talk about the challenges when we come back around uh, to some of that, but I wanted to show our approach at Reportedly. Um, and before we formed um, in January 2015, um, four, of the, four of us on the team had previously uh, covered from a distance uh, what, what had been going on um, through, indeed, Iona's reportage and through others and uh, using UGC and eyewitness uh, content from there. Um, and in our first week uh, of reporting, we, we uh, I think it was, there was a heinous bombing at the police academy in Sana'a where 30 odd people killed and, uh, were killed and through eyewitnesses there we were able to report on that. That was the same morning actually as the Charlie Hebdo attacks but it was our first story that day. Um, and I just wanted to uh, present how we do that and quite simply 
Um, have we got uh, slides up on the screen? Yeah. Oh, they're up? Yeah. Okay, great. The reason for this picture will become evident as I go through it. Um, and quite simply, it, you know, a, a Twitter list of people who are there documenting day in, day out what's going on in Yemen is a really powerful tool just to monitor what's going on and to uh, examine tips from that as to ways that we can get into the story and find other people who are related to that story, um, get them on the phone, um, find other ways of contacting them and do searches for geolocated content or for, um, for other UGC using search terms. Um, and even just one, t you know, mixed with traditional journalism, you know, one tip like this that the UN is evacuating its staff, it, it took several phone calls for us to get to the right person who was able to tell us that, but we were able to explain to people, again, we, we publish a lot through Twitter, what's going on and where they're being moved to um, and so on. Um, and by uh, constantly engaging in this story and with the people who are uh, involved in it and tracking it, um, and even retweeting them uh, to our audience. Uh, what you do is, over time, you build up a relationship with people who are there. You understand who are actors who are more trustworthy than other people who have agendas. Um, but more importantly, you're able to represent the people who are caught in the middle of this conflict. Um, and I think that's where the strength of our journalism has been, whereas Iona's would be around you know, the, the, the broader strokes of what's happening, as well as very much what's happening on the ground there. Um, and uh, some of you will remember Enduring America. They ran a daily blog of what was happening in uh, Syria. We did something very similar from uh, on Yemen every day, publishing a Yemen digest uh, about what was going on, what happened there uh, through people who were reporting from there. And even things like when um, you know, various nationalities were being evacuated after the bombs started dropping on Yemen. Um, a number of people were caught and couldn't get out. They were turning to Facebook, urging the State Department to get Americans out, and uh, in fact turned, turned out um, uh, in the US and gave speeches, again urging action. Uh, and by linking in with these people, we got stories out about that. And this chap, Mokhtar, I can't pronounce, I won't try to uh, pronounce his surname, when he left, um, Aden by boat across to Djibouti, you know, he sent us this selfie uh, of himself escaping and gave us a story afterwards. So again, just representing, and Iona just said she's taken that trip several times um, in and out of, uh, out of Yemen. Um, and, uh, you know, terrible stories like, like uh, ki extrajudicial killings and um, uh, murder on the streets. Um, and then the, the ransacking of, uh, of news outlets and, and so on. Andy covered this one. Um, and for mainstream media, uh, you know, you might think that it's something that you can't cover or it's not worth covering or nobody's interested in that, but metrics for our coverage of that on social platforms, you know, show that the opposite is true. That when you focus and you deep dive on something like this and you cover it comprehensively with all the nuances that are involved um, and, you're, and you're publishing it to people directly to people's feeds, um, that they respond to that, and, uh, and, and we've got a lift in engagement around those particular stories. And this is very early on in our, I think we were only three months reporting, Andy, at that stage. Um, the investigation, which I'll go into uh, at a later presentation, uh, step by step at six o'clock this evening, was when somebody came to us with uh, shipping documents uh, of bombs that were shipped from uh, Italy to the United Arab Emirates. Um, and this uh, by examining this and um, looking at export licenses that were granted uh, in Italy, uh, we got help from Giorgio Beretta, who is an arms monitor here, and several other people as well, including Human Rights Watch, um, to verify this information. We basically tracked these bombs made in Sardinia from Genoa through Jeddah port in Saudi Arabia onto the United Arab Emirates where they were assembled, and we tracked those bombs to the ground in Yemen. Uh, so we had a full chain from a uh, point of manufacture shipped during an armed conflict where massive civilian casualties are being um, uh, recorded uh, to forces that are bombing indiscriminately, it seems, uh, areas where there are large uh, civilian populations. Um, and 
the, the reason that we know they were manufactured in Italy is the, ca the cage number, the manufacturing number on these bombs, uh, who were photographed by human rights uh, watch researchers that were on the ground there, and I got in touch with them, and they were interested in the shipping um, lists and sent on these photographs in return, uh, RWM Italia, and we also just found where they were dropped using the metadata in the photographs, and we were able to identify um, footage of uh, the day after that attack, and of course you apply your verification um, you know, looking at the buildings and satellite imagery just to make sure that, double check that these are the, the buildings that uh, people say they are. Uh, and this is, we produced this short documentary, a two minute documentary using Google Earth to show the track, uh, to trace these uh, bombs uh, through. Um, and just a couple of other things, maybe if I just swipe over here. Again, Iona and human rights researchers with Amnesty and, um, and Human Rights Watch are the only sort of, I don't know, what would you call official? Uh, documenters that are on the ground. Um, and what struck me from the reports that they produced, Iona's and uh, Ole Solvang's and, and Rasha Mo from, um, from Amnesty, was really that the civilian death toll was just astonishing across the country. Um, and to accompany one of Iona's pieces with The Intercept, um, I created this map of the uh, eyewitness testimony uh, plus the pictures that were taken of these places and just, you know, track them across the country. Uh, okay. These are Iona's photos, photos with, with what the people said happened. Um, and it really just put sort of, it put it into context just how many people are being affected by uh, this conflict. And maybe we can circle back around and other things. But just to show you the Twitter list there, you know, it's a live list with people there who are updating you know, from Yemen and related to it. Thank you, Malaki, for this look very uh, deep inside what is going on in Yemen. And I um, want to add something about, uh, you know, that in Yemen people, even though people don't know uh, how to write, in, in reality they have Facebook. And so it's really important because um, we can track by some posts or um, civilians that post pictures or anything, um, we can try to build a narrative about it and what's basically reportedly uh, did during the last year. And Sara, um, so over to you and um, I wish to, that you let to know to the people here what's the support Yemen is and uh, what you are doing there, it's really surprising, for example, to know that there are young people in Yemen that they do parkour, for example, or they established a co-working office in Sana'a. And that's the way I discovered you as uh, supporting Yemen there, mm -hmm. so. Mm -hmm. um, well, basically, um, it all began in 2011 when, um, when the revolution started. Um, and of course, it was a crackdown on uh, on journalists. A lot of journalists were deported, and um, and others were refused entry into Yemen. So we found ourselves in a position, uh, myself and Abdurrahman, who unfortunately couldn't be here today, uh, where we were, you know, as independent filmmakers and youth activists, were in the square, um, documenting things that were happening, feeling very frustrated with uh, the way the media was portraying the the. The, the, the protests, uh, the lack of coverage, of course. So what we ended up doing was we started filming um, just on a very, um, uh, very modest, in a very modest way with, with you know, small cameras and we, we filmed stuff and then we would post them onto, on, online onto YouTube. Um, and what we found that after a while was that this started to pick up momentum. Actually, I think one of the first times I, I was in, uh, Iona got in touch with us was when we posted something anonymously. Um, a very satirical video about the former President Saleh. And things gained traction. We found that we were able to, to, to reach an audience, not a wide audience, but an audience at least, um, by, by filming stuff and posting them, disseminating them online. So what we decided to do was, um, especially after the, the massacre of, uh, of Karama on the 18th of March in 2011, um, and realizing that there was very little media coverage on, on this, that, um, that we wanted to do something about it. So we decided to, 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 um, to gather material from other cameramen who were present and, 
and make a short video. So the idea initially was that we would make a video for, again, for, for online, um, for the internet, for YouTube, um, to try to get some kind of attention, uh, to raise awareness about the, the attacks um, and the killing of approximately 53 uh, peaceful protesters. Um, and what happened um, uh, after this was that the, the film then became it, rather than a, a YouTube video, it became a, a, a short film and then it gained international acclaim and then was nominated for, the, for an Oscar. So this, for us, showed us that even with zero budget um, and hardly any equipment and no support, we were, able to, we were able to do something. We didn't have to depend on international media coming into the country. We didn't have to depend on local news outlets who were very, <clears throat> who are often quite polarized. Um, or sort of fall into one, uh, you know, they're, they're controlled by one party or another, that we could actually do, do stuff ourselves um, independently. Um, so my, my, so Abdul Rahman and myself and a few other writers and, and, and youth activists decided to set up Support Yemen um, as a media collective and, um, and gather material and, and from 2011 until today, um, tried as much as we could to be able to, um, to release videos basically covering different subjects that, um, from women, women's rights to the current war to social issues um, as a result of the war um, and, and so on. So um, what, we, what we did also last summer since the beginning of the war, we, we, we found ourselves in the same position again where uh, again there's very little media coverage of, of the war in Yemen. Um, the, um, and so I, I traveled back to Yemen. We decided to set up uh, 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 a workshop, a filmmaking workshop for youth. And um, sorry, this took this took place over the course of um, for two weeks in the summer, um, where we taught uh, some young aspiring filmmakers how to make documentary films and then make and produce films within 24 hours. So uh, maybe later on, I'll show you some of the films that uh, the students made and. Um, and some others that Support Yemen has done as well. Thank you, Sarah. We have the time for a second round. And um, uh, Sarah, she will show for sure a um, happy Yemen video. And it's something that um, stressed the concept that what, what Yemen was, Arabia Felix, the Romans said, the, the place of the Queen of Sheba. Um, but, um, <laughs> You know, before reading your uh, last report, after you you came back from Yemen, uh, do you think it's really it's really possible to stop this war right now? I mean, we are close to some talks and uh, possible truce. And yeah, a, <coughs> the ceasefire is supposed to start on Sunday night. Um, there has been more efforts to try and make that. Um, at least obtainable in some shape or form on the ground. Uh, the likelihood of that being a comprehensive ceasefire is um, extremely limited. Uh, the reality is now, unfortunately, on the ground in Yemen, the longer this war has gone on, you're slipping down the Syria route of having multiple factions now fighting on the ground for many different reasons. Uh, even in Aden now, where it's supposedly liberated and under the control of um, President Hadi, um, who isn't there, um, there are at least a dozen factions involved. I was listing them when I was there a couple of weeks ago. Between 12 and 16, depending on how you want to break it down, just inside the city of Aden. Um, some of those are with the government, some of those are on the fence, and some of those are against the government. Um, the ones that are all called Al-Qaeda are not all Al-Qaeda, they're just against the government, and some are Al-Qaeda, but they're getting bombed by the Emiratis anyway, or they've been kicked out of the city along with Al-Qaeda. Um, so yes, the, the, the issue of trying to implement a ceasefire now on the ground is really, really complicated. Um, the issue of the peace talks are supposed to start now on the 18th of April. Um, that it did look like there was some hope on that front in the last few weeks when the Houthis were, have been having now for at least a month direct talks with the Saudis, um, indicating um, some split between them and Ali Abdullah Saleh, the former president, who have been in this kind of marriage of convenience now for at least the last 18 months to two years. 
um, until President Hadi decided to make Ali Mohsen um, his vice president, which was a kind of extraordinary move. Um, I think everybody in Yemen was extremely surprised. For, without sort of going into the weeds too much of the politics in Yemen, Ali Mohsen is, um, was basically Ali Abdullah Saleh's right-hand man and most senior commander within the military under Saleh. Uh, he then defected, um, I put that slightly in quotes, um, uh, during 2011 and sent his soldiers of the 1st Armored Division to support or defend the protesters um, <coughs> in the sit-ins in Sana'a at least. Um, but uh, Ali Mohsen is uh, a wily politician just as Ali Abdullah Saleh is. He was run out of town in, of, of Sana'a in 2014 when the Houthis took control of the city. They were the only people he fought. Um, and he then fled to Riyadh and had obviously been heavily involved in helping the Saudis um, collect information on targets to hit of where ammunition depots were, where military equipment was being hidden. Um, and he is hated by at least 50% of the population in Yemen, uh, mainly the southerners particularly. Um, he was the one who really led the war, the civil war against the south in, in 1994. So now the southern resistance in Aden, who are supposedly on the side of Hadi because they hate Saleh and they see the Houthis as a front for Saleh, now find themselves on the side of their other enemy, who is Ali Mohsen. Um, this is threatening mass mutiny in Aden now. Even the Emiratis are not happy about it, obviously, because they're trying to work with the, with the southerners um, and trying to create a professional uh, military now out of what was the southern resistance last year who were basically local men armed fighters who took up weapons against um, the Houthis and Saleh forces when they came into Aden. So now they've got two enemies, um, one on one side and one who's now their commander, um, which now makes the prospect of peace talks coming up in, on the 18th of April look distinctly more complicated. It's also um, really riled the Houthi and, so, and obviously the Saleh side as well, because it's a clear indication, um, or a, an aggressive act, put it that way, um, by Hadi of appointing somebody like that, and also replacing Khalid Baha, who was considered, who, was, who had previously been the, the vice president and prime minister, who was considered somebody that, that pretty much everybody was willing to work with on, on some level. All sides were willing to work with Baha, and had been really doing so. Um, Ali Mohsen is not that same kind of figure at all. Um, he has quite the opposite effect. So yes, it, it, when that news kind of drops, uh, I think a lot of people just bang their head against the wall and just realize this war is gonna go on for a, for a long, long time yet. And even if the Saudis have now realized that they've bitten off more than they can chew, even if they stop dropping bombs tomorrow, even if the Emiratis pulled all their troops out next week, that doesn't mean the war is over. The war started before the Saudis got involved, um, and it doesn't mean it's going to stop if they decide that they've had enough. Um, and that's the problem now on the ground. Um, the politics gets a lot more complicated than that, but I'll try not to confuse you and, and, and bore you all with all of that. Um, and having crossed the front lines numerous times now, um, I witnessed the fighting firsthand in Aden um, when the uh, southern resistance were fighting the Houthis at a time when the Houthis looked like, well, they basically had control of Aden, although that was never really reported that way. They had control of the entire city of Aden. The only bit they didn't have was the refinery, which is to the west of the city, um, and Barak, or Little Aden, as it's known, which is just along the coast. Um, having got to know them as, as one group then as they were when they were fighting the Houthis and Saleh, and now to watch them all splinter into multiple different factions who are will, all willing to fight each other, as well as perhaps fight Hadi um, at the same time, you suddenly realize you know, that, that, that's, that's post-conflict. That's what post-conflict looks like in, in Yemen at the moment, and it's not a pretty sight. Um, you throw Al-Qaeda into the mix of all of that, of course, and they're being used um, as they always are, by the political elite um, in order to, to um, 
create gains for one side or the other. I can't go into too much detail about that, unfortunately, because I'm working on a, on a piece from my last visit. Um, let's just say I went to Mokala and I met with Al-Qaeda whilst I was there the last time. Um, and they didn't even try to deny what I was accusing them of, um, which was interesting. Um, but you can read that on The Intercept in the next few weeks. <laughs> But yes, it's been incredibly difficult to um, obviously eke out those nuances. You know, I'm sure people in Syria have had the same issue. It became, becomes this very, um, you know, single narrative really of this, let me say, you know, the, the narrative of the Shia versus Sunni war, which is, um, there are elements of it now in Yemen, but that's be because of the nature of what Al Qaeda is trying to push through. Um, as a Sunni-Shia conflict, and if we keep describing it as that, we're, we're just fulfilling their narrative rather than actually describing the narrative of the reality on the ground. Because yes, um, the Houthis were traditionally a Zaydi Shia Zaydi group, um, <coughs> but certainly all of the military units loyal to Ali Abdullah Saleh were not. You won't find that all of those guys who are fighting uh, on the Houth pro Houthi side, let's put it that way, are all Zaydi or they're all Shia. Um, Equally, there are many people fighting on the other side of the fence who are certainly not doing it for religious reasons. Some of them are, but a lot of people are just doing it to defend their cities or defend their homes. Um, and trying to kind of break down those, the complexities of Yemen, Yemeni politics is a challenge that we face as journalists all the time, and we often end up in huge fights with editors about. Um, I'm sorry I haven't been able to show any footage or, or pictures from my time in... Yemen over the last year, unfortunately, all of my memory cards and my external hard drive were, I was relieved of, let's just put it that way, um, at the end of, towards the end of last year, um, and I won't be getting them back. Um, <laughs> but uh, hopefully I'll be able to go back and um, I, can, I can perhaps live without them. Um, some of them you know, ended up, as, as Malik has already shown you, being used um, and were published anyway. Uh, the footage was used by Channel 4 News in the UK. Um, so at least most of it had been disseminated um, before, it was, before it was taken. Um, but yes, I think the problem is now, uh, with the politics in Yemen, it's because, as, as I said earlier, it's never really, people have never really taken on that challenge of trying to understand the politics in Yemen, perhaps as they have elsewhere in the region. Um, it means that everybody was 50 steps behind when this war started, and they're now probably 100 steps behind. And it becomes a lot easier and simpler for, for people, journalists in general, the media, 24-hour news, to, to pitch it as this narrative particularly the narrative that comes out of Saudi Arabia, of it being against an Iranian proxy, and all this, this, this kind of uh, official voices without actually getting to know the story themselves and understanding the reality of, of, of what is happening. This was a domestic political fo conflict. Um, this was definitely a civil war that was happening. Yes, it then became a regional power struggle um, because the Saudis started bombing, because the Saudis got involved. Um, but um, for all their faults, and there are many, um, I have witnessed, you know, um, a lot, I've seen a lot of evidence of indiscriminate civilians being killed by their bombing. They didn't start this war. The war had already started. Um, they just decided to get involved. Um, uh, but of course, Yemen is also a convenient um, place for them to carry out their first ever modern war, really. Saudi Arabia had all the military equipment um, from the West, it had a great air force, but it had never been put to the test. Um, as when I was, you know, uh, a phrase we used to use when I worked in horse racing is, all the gear, no idea. Um, and I think maybe that's some of the excuses they may have had early on in, in their bombing campaign. Um, but I saw incidences of, you know, 500 pound bombs being dropped in a densely um, populated residential area to take out one sniper. Um, when you, I say a 500 pound bomb, if you're using a drone uh, missile, that's about 100, 120 pounds. Um, and you're using that to take out a single vehicle, which will kill you know, whoever, whoever's in that car at the time. If you're using a 500 pound bomb in a densely populated 
um, residential area, uh, it can come as no surprise that you do kill the sniper, but you also kill 25 civilians at the same time, and that's what happened. Uh, and that's, as we've, you know, as, as Maliki was mentioning, that, that, that's not an isolated incident. I've seen it time and time again in the south, in the center of the country, in the north, um, and it's being repeated uh, on a far too regular basis. Um, but, yeah, the, the, the trouble is um, in covering Yemen right now is, A, getting the interest in doing so. There has been a lot more pressure being put on because of the issues of the of the weapons going out, um, because of you know things like Maliki has shown from their investigation, the bombs being provided to um, the coalition and being used and dropped in Yemen that are coming predominantly from uh, the West, certainly America and the UK. Uh, and thankfully, we've been seeing now in that certainly in the last six months, really, um, a lot more coverage on that and a lot more pressure happening. And even when I was actually in the South on this trip, you know the. There were three TV crews in, in Sonar at that time. There was BBC, there was Sky, um, and there was ITV, um, all doing you know, good work from Sonar. But the war is not just in Sonar. It's a population of 25 million people, and around 2 million of them, two million of them live in Sonar. Um, and I have to say, uh, the, all the time I've spent in Yemen over the past year, and I've been up and down the country, um, I think the worst of it um, I saw was certainly in Aden. Um, that was the highest level of um, violence I saw in the, in the fighting. And obviously in Tyres under the siege, I was there at the beginning of the siege. Um, but the intensity of the fighting in Aden was certainly worse and, and the destruction there was immense. Uh, unfortunately, um, nobody really got to see that because it was incredibly difficult to get, to get into the country. Um, but yes, there is, there is very little light at the end of the tunnel and at the moment, as Ibrahim Hathana once said to me, um, that light could be a train coming in the opposite direction. And unfortunately, that train seems to have Ali Mossen driving it at the moment. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Yona, for your really clear thoughts about it. And um, I, I'm thankful to you because you all also stress the concept that the narrative media about the Sunni Shia conflict is not um, well, we have exactly the picture. And, and also this conflict is really crucial for Middle East and maybe, I don't know, maybe that's one of the reasons why uh, it's undercover. But uh, Malaki, do you want to add anything about, um, <laughs> about what we said before and uh, related also your meetings of investigation or okay, yeah. what we are planning to do? Uh, well, oh, there are enough parties involved. <laughs> um, you know, people in this room uh, are probably profiting from the war in Yemen. Um, and that is because the arms companies in the UK, in the US, um, and uh, the company here in Italy uh, are selling bombs to Saudi. And that relationship with Saudi is, is, is very destructive. Um, and those profits are going back, in the case of the Italian company, to a German uh, holding company, um, and we showed in our investigation that there are hundreds of pension and education funds, uh, and also Norway's uh, re state retirement fund, and the New York State State Pension Fund for its, all of its thousands of employees, are all invested in this company and uh, as part of their portfolios, um, as well as other companies that are providing uh, sales and in the UK, um, sales of arms or licenses of arms to uh, to Saudi Arabia rocketed in in uh, 2015, um, and the coverage of that has led now to the formation of a, a committee to investigate whether or not uh, this is legal and the arms trade with Saudi should continue um, within you know the context of what's happening in in Yemen. Um, and it's a very destructive relationship. At the changing of the guard, I think, in Saudi Arabia at the time when Yemen was this tinderbox is also a very uh, significant factor. And we saw at the, the death of the former, the former king all of the leaders of the Western world turning up. And you know, it just demonstrated what that power relationship is between the US, the UK, and other Western countries uh, and Saudi Arabia. And that's just a general point. 
is that we ourselves may be profiting from this activity, um, which places an even greater onus on Western media really to, um, to cover this and to expose it and to demand change. Thank you, Malachi. So we talk about politics and bombings and, and so on, which is so you know, sad. But there's a lot of creativity. So Sarah, if you can show us what you are doing with the Combra project and what are doing the young directors in Yemen, it could be great. Um, just um, drawing on what Iona was say saying um, with regards to politics, I mean, it's very complicated in Yemen. I think most Yemenis themselves don't understand what's happening. Um, and because of that comple complexity, um, I think as a direct result of that complexity, people tend to then turn a blind eye to what's happening. So what we decided to do was really try and, um, and focus more on the, on the human stories, on the, you know, the humanitarian, humanitarian situation on the ground, and on so social, the, the, the social issues as well that were, happen that were taking place um, in Yemen. Um, and um, currently, because of the, the civil war um, in Yemen, there, is, there has been a, a massive um, polarization within society, um, you know, between north and south, between Sunni and Shia, between uh, northerners and southerners, and so on. So it's, um, you know, whether you're, you know, you come from a certain, certain background, then you're automatically labeled a Houthi or a Southern Separatist or a Daesh, ISIS or al Qaeda. So it's, um, within society itself, it's been very, very difficult um, to be able to see eye to eye with your own neighbors, sometimes within, you know, with, with people in your own families. Um, so we decided to try and focus more on those issues um, and tackle them by trying to move away from the politics and really try and remind people in Yemen and also um, you know, it's Yemenis abroad, um, and also the international community, of what the real, you know, who the real uh, victims of this war actually are. Um, so in doing so, we tried to recruit uh, Yemenis from the north and the south. Unfortunately, we weren't able to bring Yemenis from Taz and Aden uh, due to the restrictions and movement, but a lot of the, 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 the Yemenis who, who reside in Sana'a are from the south as well. So fortunately, we're able to, to bring in a lot of students who came from these different backgrounds, and we tried to equip them with some of the skills to make, make these films and tell the stories that they wanted to tell. Um, and um, I'll just I'll see if I can get this up on. I'll show you a quick video of, uh, we, we filmed the workshop that we, that we did over the summer. So I'll show you a video of that, and then I'll maybe go on to show you a one of the films that the stu one of our students made, and then one of the films that we did about the social fabric in Yemen. <clears throat> البرنامج عطاني حافز قوي ان انا اشتغل في ظل ظروف صعبه In Ramadan it was a bit tiring for everybody yet all the enthusiasm and the general atmosphere was a kind of a relief I think for the participants and the trainers you'd come here and forget everything else that was happening outside the gates of the venue البدايه ما كنت متوقع ان انا ادرس مع افلام I'm not sure if you're a good person. 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 I'm not sure if you're
بس الصورة اعتكست تماما من ضد هذا الدواء؟ احنا بحاجة توقعت انه صناعة الافلام حاجة بسيطة وما تحتاجش مجهود كبير، يعني اي حد ممكن ياخذ كاميرا وصور بلا بلا وخلاص السلام عليكم. انطباعي من اول يوم كان في معلومة كبيرة قدمت بين انه لا صناعة الافلام تحتاج انه تبني عليها معلومات. كيف تتعامل مع الكاركتر نفسه؟ كيف تصور في ظل حرب او اوضاع مش مستقرة؟ كيف تجهز له؟ كيف تجمع المعلومات؟ كيف تعرف اخلاقيات العمل؟ وكيف نتحمل المشاكل وكيف نحلها في اسرع وقت؟ كيف انه يوصل رسالة من الصورة اللي هو بيصورها؟ كيف انه مشاعره يترجمها في صورة معينة؟ بسأل نفسي أكثر من سؤال قبل ما أصور فكرة معينة. وكان المدربين بيركزوا على هذا الشيء في اكثر من شيء. الصدق اكثر حاجه لفتت انتباهي وشدتني انه اسلوب التدريس، حسيت انه ما يمشوا شيء يمشوا ساعات قد ما يمشوا يخرجوا كل مدرب وهو فاهم ايش يفعل وايش يسوي. طيب مثلا المسؤوليه بتكون أكبر شوية عليك أنت كصانع أفلام لأنه الحرب والنزاعات فيها رسائل جدا كثيرة، فيها قضايا إنسانية، فيها أطراف نزاع، انتهاكات، فيها حب الإنسان، وإبرازها بموضوعية. أول مرة أنا أشوف في اليمن من فلسطين وبعمل كمصور فوتوغرافي في تجمع اسمه أكتف ستيل، فرق بين عملنا وعمل الإعلام التقليدي، بس عندنا هنا في اليمن في معك طرفين، كل واحد يعني ما نقدرش نقول هذا الحق هنا وهذا الحق هنا. طاقة عادية ودينا خلينا أوحدهم بالخوف. الفن السياسي اللي بدهم يعملوه اليوم. أنا أنتي بدافع الشغف والفضول نعم أكيد. خلال مشاهدتنا لبعض الأفلام الوثائقية غيرت فيني أشياء فتوقع إنه في المستقبل برضو ممكن نوثق نفس الشيء ممكن. ننقل نفس الشيء يعني عن مجتمعنا لمجتمعات اخرى. كفيلم ميكر بعض الاحيان يكون الصورات اعلى علي آه اذا معك كاميرات اذا صورت في مكان معين فالصوره بتزيد عليك نعم لاحظت من ثاني يوم او ثالث يوم انه اذا ما جيت اشتغل وقت الضرب احس اني جبان المفروض انه اذا المدرب جاء خرجوا بالرغم من الوضع الامني فكان بالعكس كل ما حصل ضرب احس انه ضروري يكون في الدوره كانت بتشرح والطياره تحلق فوقنا فحسيت انه كان في خوف كان في تشتيت للذهن لكن بعد كذا لا انه كملنا و... واليوم الثاني حضرنا I'm so happy with the films that were made. They were really good and they portrayed parts of life uh, that normally uh, are not portrayed during the war. Normal images that you see in the news, they're disturbing images. There are still people resilient in Yemen um, who are living their daily lives and trying to live life as normal as possible. And that's what we wanted to show. I think the joint effort between us and Support Yemen finally paid off when we screened the films last night.
and watching the joy of the filmmakers be happy and taking photographs. And, um, even though there were there were uh, anti anti craft missiles going off from time to time. لازم نوصل رسالة في هذه الفترة خصوصا إحنا لازم نبادر لازم لازم أول شيء نتعلم على أساس نعرف كيف نصنع كيف نصنع الفن في زمن الحرب اللي إحنا كمان عايشين فيه في الوقت الحالي للأسف. فأتمنى هذا الشيء. Another reason we, we, we decided to do this was also because um, the morale in Yemen was pretty low and uh, all, the, all the young aspiring filmmakers that we knew were very depressed. Um, as one of the students mentioned in the beginning, they, nobody left the house and very, people were very scared of the situation um, outside. <clears throat> Obviously ca carrying a camera is more dangerous than carrying a weapon. You know, If you carry a, a, an AK-47, you're less likely to be arrested. So, um, so I think this really gave us, you know, um, the incentive to try and, and and do something that would inspire some of the, the youth to continue to make films, um, and 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 make them realize that they didn't actually have to be out in the streets filming to, you know, to be able to, to put a message across, and that they could also they could film indoors. Um, so we we, gave, we showed them a few examples of how they could do this, and um, and we tried to encourage them to make films that were focused on the indoors rather than putting them at risk. Um, the office that we set up um, a couple of years ago in Yemen, the Support Yemen office, is situated in uh, the political quarter in, um, in Sana'a, so it was actually a very dangerous location for us to be in, unfortunately, but, um, but, but luckily we managed to get through um, the, the few weeks and the weeks following this um, with no hassle. We, um, there were airstrikes nearby and, and, and the airstrikes continued throughout the whole workshop um, but I think just the, the fact that we were together and we're sort of working through this, it really kind of, insp it, 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 it did boost the morale of everybody that was, that was working um, on the films. And, um, and since then, the, the, the young filmmakers that sort of graduated from this workshop have, um, have now continued to help us. So even when Abdurrahman and myself are not in, on the ground in Yemen, they're still doing a lot of work where we, we, we help um, NGOs and other organizations such as the UN and Oxfam um, with, with their videos um, or, or um, video material. And we've tried to do other, um, other stuff and documenting, mainly documenting um, testimonies of, um, of you know, victims of airstrikes. Um, even though a lot of the material hasn't been used thus far, at least we do have something um, for future reference, hopefully. So um, maybe later on I can show another video, but I can maybe move on. Uh, thanks, Sarah, and especially because I, I know your feelings now. <laughs> and thanks for showing us what the people of Comra, they, they did and they are still doing there. And I really want to, to tell again that I'm really very sorry the Rahman is not with us now. Okay, so let's open the floor to the questions. If you have any questions for our speakers, um, um, go ahead with it. And uh, don't kidnap the microphone, of course. <laughs> okay, for five minutes, just um, clear questions and directly to, to them. Uh, first of all, thank you for that. Um, I thought that was fascinating. I just had a question for each of the speakers, really. What one thing do you think could happen in Yemen that would significantly improve the situation? difficult one because one really means many. Um, uh, I suppose it really has to be um, direct talks at a high level. Um, what we've seen at the moment has been in the last few attempted rounds, whether by the UN or, or elsewhere, even behind closed doors a lot of the time, it, it's really low level or mid-level, should I put it that way, mid-level um, individuals from the different parties involved um, that are really involved in the negotiations. And to get anywhere, people have got to take it seriously. And it's got to be 
done, therefore, at a higher level. But to add into that, of course, as I said earlier, the complexities of the conflict now means that there are so many different factions involved. Um, it needs to be opened up then um, to, to more people. You need to have representation from the South, for example. You can't ignore um, the existence of the Southern movement, call it the Southern resistance. Um, they weren't involved in the political transition which collapsed and then ended up with this war. Um, uh, they weren't represented in really in the NDC, although they tried to say they were, which is a national dialogue conference um, that was part of the transition phase after the uprising in 2011. So yes, it's about having the right kind of talks, I suppose, um, and having more voices <coughs> included. Otherwise, you're not going to get um, either a comprehensive ceasefire or anything near a comprehensive peace. It'll only be putting things on hold again, um, which is what happened with the GCC deal. That was just a press pause. Um, and then it was, it was inevitable that there was going to be a conflict. Um, I just don't think that everybody thought that Saudi Arabia was going to be as directly involved as they ended up becoming. And as Maliki you know, already said, that, that that was as much about their own domestic um, changes uh, as anything else. But yes, I just think it's the real risk of, of repeating really what happened with the GCC deal um, uh, because of the, of the mass sort of panic in the Western community, again, looking at Yemen through the Al-Qaeda prism, as we've got, to, we've got to put a pause on, stop on this as soon as possible, um, which is obviously, you know, important now because of the humanitarian situation, but you try and do a rush job, and again, it's, it's, it's not going to achieve anything. You're only um, kicking the can down the road. I would say the same, and uh, as that is happening, um, it's a bit of a sticky plaster solution, but to stop the bombing, uh, which is causing the most civilian casualties uh, and the most damage. Of course, there are abuses on, on, on all sides, but um, uh, that would allow for aid to get in um, as well. Um, yeah, I'd echo what Iona said and uh, Maliki. Um, it's, um, it's a difficult one because I think uh, also sort of looking at it from, a, from the point of view of, as a, of a civilian and someone who lived under the airstrikes and became very uh, disillusioned by the, by the situation, by, the, by politics, um, it's very difficult to stay positive and, and hopeful. But um, I mean, one, one problem, you know, one of the, the main concerns, I think, um, as, as a Yemeni and as someone who has... Um, you know, has always had very strong ties with people from the, from from Taz and Aden and all over Yemen. Um, watching what is happening in within society is really the most worrying because, you know, even you know if, if airstrikes destroy the infrastructure of the country, if the social fabric is really destroyed and and um, and this hatred towards one another is instilled, um, uh, then I think that's going to be the most difficult thing to repair at post-war. So. Um, I think, um, as well as, of course, you know, stopping the airstrikes. I think it's, um, I think it's, it's really the responsibility for for Yemenis who can to try and 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 build bridges again and really help, you know, sort of try and um, salvage what is left of the ties within within Yemen We're amongst Yemenis. Any question? Okay. How about that? I have a question for Sarah. My name is Nadia, representing Community Media Forum Europe. Um, would you define your project, Comra, as a community media project? And have you thought about also doing radio training with young people in Yemen as something that they could also continue, which is more sustainable and would also, I imagine, not put them at risk as much as reporting on video and actually showing themselves as being active? Thank you. It is a it is a community project. Um, uh, this one was supported by the the, the British Council, um, and it kind of happened as a spur of the moment um, uh, workshop. But since then, we've done a second one, which focused on uh, on drama. So we did fiction films, um, and we're hoping that from that we'll then um, continue on to doing radio and other and and other stuff. We, we've also done a few um, workshops on writing, creative writing as well as journalistic writing, and um, so we're trying to do as much as we can, even though we're not always in the country and um, 
and we, it's very difficult to get funding as well, and not that many people know about us, but um, uh, that is the hope, yeah, um, to try and get as much funding as we can to, to, to be able to ex expand on this and do more. Yeah, I'd just like to kind of, which I haven't mentioned already really, is I'm only able to do the work that I'm able to do for the international press because of um, the Yemenis that have helped me along the way. Um, no, I don't, I, I think, I can't even use the term fixers because they're friends, you know. Um, that's people that have helped me get across the country. Um, they've helped me either with translation or, you know, gathering information um, on a regular basis or when I'm out of the country as well, um, informing me about what's going on. And, you know, it's, it, it, this is why what, what Sarah's been doing is, is so important because... Um, I really feel it's, it's, it's so much better when, when, you know, Yemenis can take charge of the conversation themselves. Um, unfortunately, it's incredibly dangerous for a lot of them to do so. Um, uh, and particularly, you know, the, the, the people that have helped me, I couldn't even name any of them um, because of the implications um, for them. And um, I think there is a huge amount of, of talent um, uh, and willingness and even determination on behalf of a lot of people on the ground. Um, but it is because of the polarized nature of the conflict and it's so fluid at the moment of, of what's happening either in Tyres or in Sanar of maybe who's in charge now and who may be char in charge in another six months or a few months time. It's incredibly dangerous for people on the ground who are trying to report on the conflict um, of becoming um, a victim in all of that. Uh, you know, the Houthis have been uh, arresting <coughs> activists, people tweeting, you know, um, against them for several months on end. Um, journalists, Al-Qaeda's got journalists in prison. Um, this is across the board now in the country that, you know, citizen journalists, political activists, um, anybody uh, who's trying to work with any kind of force in civil society now is, is at risk um, from all sides in the conflict. And so, yeah, I, w I wouldn't be able to do it if it wasn't help for Yemenis. I'd be, I'd be useless without them, and I'm incredibly grateful for all the help that, that they've given me over, over the last, well, six years, but in more so over the last year for being able to make it possible to do the work that I've done. Yeah. Uh, maybe we could mention what happened, for example, to al Mujali, Mojali, who was one of the, the well-known fixers in, in Yemen. For me, he was like a brother because we, we worked for two years and a half side by side, and, and one day it happened that I received by, by Facebook the, the news that it was killed by, by Saudis. But, but it's important to mention that uh, before he, um, he went out of the country because Houthis, they, um, they, they threatened him because he wrote a piece about uh, the, um, the children, soldiers, and so civilians and local journalists, they, they are, you know, they're in the middle and they, uh, they have really bad times right now. And, and also we tried to establish um, a kind of media house in Sana, but it's very difficult to find people uh, to, to work there and especially have permissions or work for foreign media. So, uh, actually, it's very difficult to, to have news, except in a way that uh, reportedly uh, is doing very, very well. Um, any question from the floor? Okay, so uh, we have five minutes to show something beautiful about this beautiful country. Okay, um, I'll show one of the student films. Um, that was made during the Gumro workshop. So the, the challenge for them was to try and um, and uh, organize and um, sort of uh, coordinate film and edit a film um, under five minutes within 48 hours. Of course, there was a lot of pressure and there were sleepless nights, but they managed to get through it. So this is one of the, one of my favorite ones anyway. We, we, we made four in the end, and then since then we've made, a, we've made several others. Um, it's called The Loaf of Bread. I hope the audio works.
Next landing is down. Okay, let's see if it works again. Who's downloading? أول ما صحيت من النوم صحيت على الانفجارات الساعة 11 ونص قبل الحرب كنت أصحى وأنا آمن وجلست أنا وأخوتي نتحاكاو وقمنا الصبح وهذا وأسير المدرسة درس ونفعل للراحة ونخرج نلعب نحن وأصحابي من غير نسمع أي حاجة كنا يعني بأمان وأمان. أسأل عن الأسرة أشتغل عن أمي أمي مريض وأبي مريض لو أنا أخرج عن بعهم أقول لي ركع سليم لو أنا أخرج أشتغل أقول لي لا مغرب أروح يعني ما يخلوني شيء ناس كثير هذه الأيام نلعب أحيانا وأحيانا ما نخرجش نلعب نسبة الحرب وأقول بين بين نفسي أتمنى أن الحرب تنتهي يعني نجلس خايف أربعة وعشرين ساعة كنت أحلم إني أوقع دكتور وأشتي إني ما أكونش بهذا أشتغل بهذا الشغل الميزان وهذا أشتي أتعلم وأكمل دراستي وأوقع دكتور لكن ما يأتي متحقق غير نجعل على الأطفال الذي مجرد في الشوارع والنازحين نزعل عليهم نقدر إحنا ما كان إحنا على ما إحنا قلق على أبي وأمي إذا أنا في الشارع إذا وقع قص أروح صليهم نحب الطيارات أما هذه الأيام نخاف من الطيارات لأن الطيارات هذه الأيام شو عام السمام تجي تقصف يعني ما إيش حالها الطيارة هذه الأيام أكثر حاجة يفرحني إن أنا لما أشوف أمي وأبي أتمنى إني الحرب يعني هذه توقف وارجع طول المدرسة وبعدين ارجع للجامعة وبعدين ارجع توظف وتوقع يعني شخصية كبيرة بالمستقبل هذه الحرب تنتهي That's life in Yemen. Thank you, Sarah. 
And uh, I wish to thank you all Yemenis are here today with us. And I would like to, to say more, but I know that all people here, uh, this panel, they, they wish that will come a time of peace and we can say that again, Yemen will be happy. And thank you for, for all the panel and for giving us a, such a great effort and telling us what well, well, this country is, the good, the bad, and the wise uncovered by media. Thank you, Sarah, Iona, and Malachi. And thank you, everybody, for coming.